Hi, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World, and uh, today I wanted to talk to uh, a brother that I just respect so much. Um, I met him at Trinity College a, a couple years ago. Uh, his name is Dr. Kerry Lattimore, and uh, he is the chair of the history department down at Trinity. And uh, first I want to ask Dr. Lattimore how, how he's doing, it, but then I want to ask him, I want to make sure I get this right, it's Trinity University, it's not Trinity yes. College. I, I should have known that because I, I still have my Trinity coffee. We have a Trinity College, I believe, in D.C., Oh, you know, and I, Connecticut, and I think you just came from D.C., right? You know, I did. There you go. That, that's my excuse. So, All right, we got you. That, that's, that's what brothers do for each other. You know, we, 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 we clean, each clean up each other's messes. I, res, I appreciate that, man. Instead of, instead of saying, hey, you're an idiot, what's wrong with you, you got it wrong, you said, hey, you know, you were in D.C. That's why you got the name that's of right. the university wrong. Well, um, you know, I, I went to Trinity University, um, and I, I gave a speech a couple of years ago. I met... Uh, I, I met you there. You were my host. Uh, you were you were awesome. Uh, I met your your campus president, uh, who was an, an awesome guy too. And uh, I, I I said to myself a long time ago, I wanted us to talk again. And uh, I saw it as an opportunity. We we had created this uh, Facebook fan page called uh, Black Scholars United uh, that people had encouraged me to create in order to. Uh, allow scholars to talk to young scholars and, 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 and even young scholars who didn't go to school. Right. And so I wanted to uh, reach out to talk to you because uh, you've had a great career and you've done a lot of great things. Uh, you're, you're the chair and you're younger than most of the people in your department. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, still. <laughs> still, oh, really? We're, we're changing. And so I'm now probably closing up into the middle group now. So We've got a whole group of younger people coming in, and that's a, it's a good thing. It's a nice thing. Um, it's also a sad thing to see some people um, leave because the department, when I came in, you know, I was the baby, and they kind of took me under their wing, and they, you know, embraced me in interesting and in, in great ways, and now I'm having to give that back, which is great. It gives me an opportunity to do that. Not sure if age-wise I was thinking I was ready yet, but, you know. Mm. Never know the things that get tossed on to you, and you enjoy it, and it's it's a good it's a good time. It's a good time. Yeah, it's a crazy transition, isn't it? When when you go from being the young guy and the new kid on the block to right. <laughs> being the person where where people reach out and say, um, "I'd really like for you to mentor me." Right. And, and, and you're thinking, "Wait a minute, I'm looking for a mentor." <laughs> exactly. And, and you know, sometimes you know, as you well know, as being African Americans in the work that we we do, we often are the youngest. African Americans to do the things that we do. Um, that I think one of the things about I, I think the majority of African Americans who get their PhDs tend to do it at an older age than the percentage of um, non-African American PhDs. And so, you or I who got our PhDs relatively early, we really are young. And then you know we 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 graduated young, we you know got our PhDs young, and then as we see that transition go. It's a little bit interesting as we go from that young person doing that to the more not as young person doing that. And so it's interesting. In the church, we sometimes do that too, the young minister. And then when the young minister becomes, a, you know, gets 30 or 40, he's no longer as young. And so we have to adapt to different situations. And I guess it's good because we've had that opportunity to be mentored. Now is our chance and opportunity to give back what we receive from many areas from family community and also work sites so it's interesting i'm still trying to figure out how to i mean i'm, I'm still working that through right now yeah it's you know I, I think that with life that's the way it is you you never you always think that in the future you'll have a blueprint and an understanding right. on how the universe works and everything will make sense but really i i have found that in every stage of my life that i've hit um, i'm hitting that stage obviously for the first time Right. So each time I'm trying to figure it out. And then what happens is once you figure out that stage that you're in, you're in it's the next time to go stage. to another one. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you hit your 20s. You're like, OK, I want to figure out how to be a 20 something. And then you finally get it. And then it's like, oh, no, but you're 31 now, you know, and then you, same thing happens in your 30s. Right. And, and then you're in your 40s. And you're like, wait a minute, I'm one of the 30 year olds. Right. No, no you're not. You know, um, so so let me ask you. OK, so where, now where'd you go to college? I did my undergrad at the University of Richmond, but before that I started at a junior college, um, Rappahannock Community College. I dropped out of my first university, which was Hampton University in Virginia. Um, Hampton, what used to be Hampton Institute, now Hampton University, 
and I was a 17 year old kid that really wasn't ready for you know when you have a 17 year old kid grew up on a farm um, wasn't ready and so I ended up dropping out and I went to a community college, junior college Rappahannock Community College for two years and then I transferred to the University of Richmond um, the Richmond Spiders of course the bad mascot of spider things that you just want to squash but <laughs> We had a great basketball team. We went to NCAA tournament the year, you know, during the period when I was there. Then I did my master's and PhD at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. So different places, um, all of them, but all great experiences. Even my time at Hampton, even though I left, it was a, a great experience. I just wasn't ready for it at that point in time. I think sometimes a lot of kids, and I was 17, a kid, sometimes college isn't you know, we aren't ready for that experience, whether it be academically for some, whether it be socially for others. Um, I think a lot of times, and I see it with my students at Trinity, some of them, you know, not mean that they're not college ready or college able, but they may not be just ready at that point in time. And sometimes I think our society pushes everybody into a same process. And for me, it probably worked better that I ended up at a junior college, which allowed me to kind of mature and then move on to another four-year university and just be ready to go from there. Wow. So you did a lot of uh, bouncing back and bouncing around a little bit. A lot of – there were a couple of years where I was going to different places, you know, one year and then two years, one place, and then two years and then graduate school, you know, the next seven, <laughs> actually six. Wow. So you – um, okay, now I, I'm curious now then. Um, mm -hmm. So when you got to Hampton, what was your major when you got there? My major was going to be music. Really? And I was a trombonist. And, um, you know, that was what I did. People thought I did well. And I, you know, I, my mother was a music teacher. And so I thought that that was exactly what I wanted to do. And you know how college is. You get into something, you figure out, you know, you learn and you, you know, that's not necessarily for me. And so I didn't, I liked history, but it wasn't something that I thought that I could do and something that I didn't think that I really wanted to do. And I thought that music was it, but I found out quickly, not necessarily because of the classes, but, you know, my own personal development that music was something that I enjoyed, but it was not something that I necessarily wanted to do for my career and my life. And when I worked at, went to the community college, I had a really good history professor and then when I did my undergrad the University of Richmond I had a really great mentor and you know it's amazing what mentorship can do you know young people we don't think automatically you know it's not like people come in with this thing this is what I'm gonna be it often is because of the relationships that we have with people that we see what they do and we want to emulate the things that they do. Not necessarily to be the same, but we, we like their professions, we like their careers, and we could see ourselves doing something similar. Now, my advisor in my undergrad, he's different from me, but I could see how he looked at scholarship and research and the teaching profession, and I like that, and I love that. Initially, I wanted to teach at a junior college because I loved the diversity of the junior college, the junior community college, you teach young people of all races, of all backgrounds, a lot of older students, um, students who have left universities and come back, or students who, you know, went to high school and went to work for 20 years and they come back. I liked that initially. And then um, life proceeded and it became, you know, as I went through, I thought, well, maybe I teach at a university, um, much like the university that I'm going to, University of Richmond. So seeing people in their professions and do great in those professions was a way of modeling. You know, I, I modeled myself after what I saw, and they mentored me and said, you don't have to be just like us, but this is a career opportunity and a career path that you might want to enter. And so that's kind of how it became. And we all need mentors. And you know, that's the great thing that you do, boys, is that you – mentor lots of people from a variety of backgrounds. Um, I remember, I don't know if you remember growing up, I, you know, I used to watch Tony Brown's Journal mm, yeah, on PBS. I and I would watch it and I just love to see that brother talking about deep issues. I always wanted to do that. 
he didn't, you know, he wouldn't, he didn't, he doesn't know how many people he touched, but he touched people that could never have that, would never have that opportunity to say, hey, thank you. I think all of us, regardless of where we are, if we are successful, it's because of good mentorship, whether it's at home, and I had great mentorship at home with my mother, mother and father, but it's also mentorship in occu it's occupational mentorship people that you see working in occupations and employment that you mentor yourself after mm. sorry for that long answer no i think that was a great answer because i uh, when you said that mentors matter or mentorship matters it it really um it really struck a chord with me because uh you know when i was in um college at the university of kentucky i met uh, a, a black man who was the only African American uh, business school professor at the University of Kentucky at that time. In fact, uh, he was the first African American in the entire business school to get tenure. Wow. Uh, and and it and his name was Dr. Tommy Whitler. He teaches at DePaul University. And the funny thing is that um, I th I think that it's an absolute crime that we have so many universities that have had you know that have this hundred year history where they right. haven't, haven't given where they have departments where they haven't given tenure to a single African American yeah. or <clears throat> some of which have, have never even hired an African American um, and, and I think about I, the reason I think I'm very passionate about that issue is because had I not met that man I never would have got right. my PhD in finance um, you know he was the guy that I met and uh, I remember when I met him I went to go see him but I didn't know what he looked like and I was looking for um, <clears throat> the the faculty advisor for um, some organization I joined I want to say was it Beta Gamma Sigma or it, something like that some honorary society mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> and so I was looking for him and he walks out of his office and I'm thinking honestly I'd never seen a black college professor before and I was like a junior at that time so I said mm -hmm. I said so I'm thinking he's the janitor or something you know right. and that's how horrible it was I mean I literally could not even even imagine a but black the man but is that you know on college campuses that's more likely to not see a pro black professor yeah and so I asked him I said um I said um, is Dr. Whitler here and he said I'm Dr. Whitler and I said you are, and I, I got excited, you know, because I, I I didn't have the luxury of seeing a black college professor. In fact, in all the years I went to school, I got you know two bachelor's degrees, several master's degrees, and my PhD. Um, so I've taken so many more classes than I can count. I've never had a black teacher in any of those classes, and I think that we should not look at that layout and just say, well, that's okay. Black people aren't supposed to be on on these campuses. No, it, it makes a difference. I mean, if I had not met that man who told me that you know, wait, well, you know, you might want to consider getting a PhD in finance, I never would have gotten a PhD in finance. Right. And he's been my mentor for over twenty years. He's actually one of my best friends now. If I were to get married, he would be uh, he he would be a candidate for the best man. We live in the same city. I see him all the time. So this was a, a long you know, quarter century relationship right. that. that was built because somebody decided to hire to hire a black man, um, and the other thing that's interesting about what you said is that it seems like you have you have the mentors that give you that back and forth interaction that tell you when you're about to do something stupid, uh, and and there are a million things that I've done that my mentor probably thinks were ridiculous, uh, even, even to this day. Even to this day, he'll call me and say, "Boys, what you should be doing is this." <laughs> so, um, but then you have you have mentors. Um, you have maybe role models and maybe you have, right. you have inspirations and or at mm -hmm. least for me those were the categories I had so I had you know inspirations in my life that were individuals like uh, Malcolm X Muhammad Ali uh, I read their I'd read their story to get courage mm -hmm. to deal with my story and realize that what, right. what I was going through wasn't that bad and then in terms of role models or people that kind of got me thinking about what I wanted to do as a scholar I'll never forget when I first when I was first introduced to three people uh, one was Michael Eric Dice, and I saw him on BET. Mm -hmm. and he, he's just flapping, you know, 100 miles an hour like a rapper. You know, he actually came to the University of Richmond when I was there. Did he and really? He did a talk, and I was like, wow, that brother's tight. And, you know, that was what I was like, because, you know, at the University of Richmond, we didn't see many African Americans coming to speak. And so this black guy's coming to speak, and we were like, wow. But, and again, I got a chance to talk to him there, and he. You know, he always was very, you know, he's, he was positive with a young brother. He took time when this young brother came and spoke, you know, and asked him a question. So I, you know, you know he wouldn't remember it, of course. I was, I always thank him for the fact that he, you know, acknowledged me. And I think sometimes, you know, when I see a young brother or anybody, but especially when I see a young brother and I know what he's going through, um, 
I just want to reach out to that brother, you know, because I know that, the, you know, sometimes college campuses or the world in itself can be a difficult place to navigate. It's, it's a different, difficult world out there. And so, you know, him and Spike Lee, we heard Spike Lee and, you know, they were always people that would say, yo, brother, it's all, it's all good. And just that sometimes can be the little inspiration to give you that extra incentive to study a little harder or to enhance your horizons a little bit and say, maybe I should think about graduate school. Maybe I should go to medical school or maybe I should do law school because they've done it and they saw something of value in me. You know, I've never met Cornell West, but I hear he does the same kinds of things. And so it's this fraternity that I, that we have and not just a fraternity of brothers, but a fraternity that we have to, in academia, find ways of expanding. And expanding not just the people who are between 18 and 22, but expanding it much more broadly. Um, because I think everybody can benefit from some of the experiences that we've had and some of the knowledge that we have and some of the knowledge that they have. And they can bring it together. Um, so that's oh, absolutely, man. Hey, absolutely. So many inspirations out there. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I'll, I'll never forget the first time I, I saw Mike. Um, I'll never forget the first time I talked to Cornell West. Um, of course, he didn't, you know, he talked to me for about one minute, 30 seconds, <laughs> because he had 50 people in line. To talk right. To uh, I'll never forget when someone asked me the question. They said, have you ever heard of Dr. Julianne Malvo? And uh, and I, I remember exactly where I was sitting when they asked me that question. I remember reading her book, Sex, Lies, and Stereotypes. And so years later, when I got a chance to meet these people and interact with them, and, and sometimes disagree with them, uh, right? You know, Mike and I had a you know we had a pretty fierce text message exchange because he didn't like a video that we did about him. Uh, but I I had to I had to start I have to start off every conversation by by really pay, getting on my knee and paying respects to the fact that. Uh, that these children gave, or these, excuse me, these individuals, I, I call them children, but I'm their, I'm their child. Right. They, they gave birth to me as a scholar, and you, and you just can't, you, you, you have to give credit to your parents, uh, whether they right. be physical parents, spiritual parents, intellectual parents, and and that's what they kind of were for me. And sometimes we disagree with them, but we still love them. Exactly, and and, and you know, and it's funny you mentioned that, and I want to ask you about this, Doctor Lattimore. I, I think that uh, if someone brought this up, uh, you know. Because I, I there was a there, I was in a controversy a couple weeks ago with some scholars and and we, we really got into it about an issue that I that I really just refused to kind of uh, let anybody bu- bully me on it. But mm-hmm. uh, one of the things that somebody reached out to me and said that was very simple that I actually that really made me think is they said, you know, as black scholars, why do we feel that why would anybody feel that we have to agree on everything? in order to respect mm-hmm. each other. Yeah. It isn't part of intellectual freedom having the right and ability to fight it out, disagree vehemently, but at the end of the day, you know, like basketball players on the court say, you know what, uh, you, you, your game is still good. Right. Uh, you know, you're wearing the other uniform right now, but I respect you. Um, I, what do you think about that? I mean, how do you think scholars can kind of balance that, you know, so that we don't sort of, uh, because sometimes, I'll, you know, I'll give you an example that really came to mind for me as well was when Cornell West, you know, began to be so vocal in his issues with the presidency. Right. Uh, you literally had people trying to destroy him, and mm-hmm. and other scholars saying this guy is not legitimate. His, you know, he's worthless. And I right. said, well, does it have to go that far? Uh, what? Give me, give me your thoughts on that. I'll, I'll stop talking. And let you answer. I, that. I agree with you. I, I think historically that maybe part of the problem when we start talking about the black community. Um, There is a black community, but there are often black communities that take part of that black community. And African Americans have come from different places, and so we have different experiences, and yet sometimes outside of the black community, there is this view that there's one opinion and one way, and then sometimes we kind of acquiesce to that and, and seem to agree with that. And so maybe it's a, uh, I, I don't think it's a healthy thing that we're supposed to all vote the same way. We're, we, we're supposed to, it's like group thinks sometimes. Um, my experiences as an African-American that grew up on a farm are far different in many respects from an African-American who may have grown up in the suburbs or the inner city. That doesn't mean it's any less African-American. It's just a different African-American experience. And any person that has different experiences will have a different set of 
questions that they bring to every issue. Um, so I think it's unhealthy when there's the idea that there has to be one way out of this because questions are too deep for there always to just be one way. That that's that's you know as an academic there are so many answers to questions. How can you just say that there's one way? That that's a limiting thought and that should be antagonistic in a sense to what we do as academics. We write a thesis, we have to come up with a thesis, then we have to support it. But if that if what we find doesn't support it, then we have to change. We're not supposed to just fit it into what we think. The argument that we think is what it should be. Um, so I think differences of opinion are healthy. I think when communities don't have differences of opinions, then it becomes unhealthy. That's probably the problem with a lot of our political parties. There doesn't seem to be a lot of different thought within each political party. You follow along the line and you go with it. I would hate to think that African Americans in academia have to follow the same way because that's unfair to us as individuals, as scholars, and as African American human beings. We should be able to disagree, but to do it in a very respectful way. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I love it. I love it. Um, always show respect. Um, yeah. Uh, be intellectually free. Uh, I respect that. And uh, now, now you, uh, I, I, w I want to finish this up by asking you a question about your career, and, and I want people to know that I'm going to talk to Dr. Lattimore in the future, uh, because we, we, we were talking about all the things that we wanted to discuss, and uh, I, I wanted to avoid the temptation of trying to fit everything into one conversation. Uh, so, uh, now tell me about your area of expertise. Uh, you, now, I know you're the chair of the history department, mm -hmm. but what, what specific area is your... It's 19th century history, in the African American South, um, I focus primarily on African Americans who were free before the Civil War, and so free African Americans, and look at their impact in a post-Civil War society. And so kind of, I look at what happens to African Americans who were free and had certain privileges in a society in which now the majority of African Americans were freed. Mm. And so how those two communities, in a sense, become one. Um, I think it tells us a lot about who we are and these same questions that we were just talking about and that they had a different experience. They were still, how should some people, some people might say slaves without masters, but they still had a different experience um, that was an African American experience, but it was a different experience, differing according to what their, and even within that group, there were different statuses even among them. And yet after the war, there's external pressures for them to be one united community. And generally, I look at Richmond, generally they do become that one community, but it's not an easy process. And I think it's the same thing for us as African Americans today. We're fighting and struggling to define what it means to be black. Hmm. But different people come to it with different backgrounds. Hmm. And there are many things that we share in common, most definitely. you know. I know how it feels to be followed around a store. Um, I know how it feels to be called an inn. Um, so that is there. But there are other different things that different people bring to the table. If I come from the, if my parents are from the Caribbean or the West, the West Indies, they have a different experience. Or if they're from Africa, they have a different experience than mine, which is a Southern African American experience. But then we still are struggling with finding that community, those connections. And the African American community, in a sense, has been doing that since, in a sense, we arrived here and defining who we are. Sometimes against how other people are trying to define us. But different experiences, sometimes not seen as different experiences. And so we struggle, we fight, and we progress, but those questions are always there. And so I think, for me, it's finding those differences in the African American community and then finding out how we address those differences and then move forward with them. I still think there's an African American community, don't get me wrong, but it's much more diverse than sometimes I think we let ourselves believe. Mm. Wow. And we let ourselves believe that and we appreciate that and we celebrate it. I think there's so much more that is out there for us as a people. Well, you know, it's it's um, you know, I, I think that when you ask that question, what does it mean to be black, or should it mean one thing to be black? 
um, I just flip it and think, well, should it mean one thing to be white? What, yeah. does it, what does it mean to be white? And I think that it would be ridiculous to try to collapse whiteness into one experience. Right. And yet we do that with blackness. Right, right. Which right there tells us that maybe we're answering a question that, or, you know, we're trying to answer a question that doesn't have an answer. Or, right. you know, it, it's um, just like in mathematics. Sometimes you have equation, equations that have multiple solutions. Right. And, and this might be one of those examples. Uh, well, you know, I um, I, I just, I, I love, it, you really opened up a rabbit hole toward the end uh, when you told me more about your area of expertise. Um, I can already tell that that's going to be a topic that I want us to discuss, to discuss in the future. Um, and so today I, I just wanted to, you know, wrap with you, man, and get a chance to get your, your perspective, who you are, and let people know who you are. And and I want to encourage people to reach out to you, um, or they can reach out to me, and you know I Definitely. can connect them with you, uh, because I, I think that the information and the knowledge that you bring to the table is is so uh, so profound and powerful and meaningful. Um, so I just want to say thank you for taking the time to talk to me, man. Thank you so much. You take care, my brother. Absolutely, you too. And uh, for those of you who are watching, thank you for checking us out at Your Black World. Uh, if you are, if you are a scholar, and that, and sometimes scholars don't go to school. If you're That's a right. if you're a scholar, you can go to our Facebook page, uh, Black Scholars United where we kind of talk about some of these scholarly issues. And, and, um, and in fact, I want to introduce everyone at some point to a couple of scholars I met who actually did their study in prison, uh, but they studied for 20 years, which is longer than most of us go to wow. school. Uh, Daryl Padgett and Yurima Karama. Um, uh, Daryl is, is a legal expert because he actually learned enough law that he actually secured his own release from prison. Uh, he actually explained to his attorneys how to fight his case. Uh, Yurima Karama uh, is a guy who wrote probably 10 books while he was in prison and he says he read over 100 uh and uh i i re and when i speak to these guys i i sense the intelligence you know and and so i i want to leave leave out on that note to let people know that there's enough information in the world out here where you can be a scholar without having to be validated by a university or spend money on a bunch of tuition um you know and, and we're just here to kind of guide you and support you in that journey so um until we meet again uh, please stay strong be blessed and be educated we are gone peace